right, uh, for our final article, landmark article on pelvis, we've got Dr. Claude Saji, who's going to be talking to us about examination under anesthesia for pelvic ring injuries. Um, Dr. Saji is at University of Cincinnati. And Adam was kind enough to do the interview. We'd like to welcome everybody to the AO Journal Club. Dr. Saji is going to talk to us about the examination under anesthetic for occult pelvic ring instability. Dr. Saji, could you give us a brief overview of the design? Well, the impetus for the study was born out of another paper that we wrote and something that we noticed in there was that there was in fact a higher rate of symphyseal plating failure and loss of reduction if people presented with certain radiographic features and, and felt that if that, that might in fact be a, a marker for more instability than we we theoretically or historically have attributed to the young Burgess classification scheme. Sometimes when you clamp the synthesis, it comes together perfectly. And sometimes when you clamp the synthesis, it comes together and you can't internally rotate it anymore, but one pubic body is a little higher than the other, one is a little more posterior than the other maybe, or both. And and you know this is kind of one of these peculiar findings. It's like, well, what the heck, what's going on here? So there's there's multiplanar instability involved in that. And so the, the study was designed to try to take a look at all these these fractures and the injuries. Primarily, are the B type is this huge gray zone where I think that there's such a, a, a wide spectrum uh, that we sought to investigate a little bit more with the whole concept of this examination under anesthetic. The series of, of views and, and maneuvers that we described and performed was basically based off of how we conceptualized uh, our injury based on the young Burgess classification, which is a mechanistic type classification, you know, to somehow try to elucidate all of that together at the same time trying to compress on the trochanters, internally rotate the legs or the next one where, you know, where we have the patient frog leg. The figure where we are shown doing the push and the pull, the whole reason we added this to it was because of what I referenced earlier on that symphyseal plate study. That's what I think we're trying to figure out here is this asymmetry with one pubic body relative to the other. And you do a push-pull, which in theory, is simulating weight bearing. So the, 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 the point was to take a bunch of B-type fractures that we're going to fix and see if, in fact, they move. The one caveat to that is the APC1, which isn't really technically a B-type fracture, I guess. The reason we included APC1s was because we felt that, well, I bet you there's a bunch of APC1s that are actually truly APC2s if we want to think and box things that way. What were the main results? Uh, were you surprised in any way about what you found? One is that, in fact, there are APC1s that are really APC2s. There are fractures that come in that look really stable, but in fact are much more unstable than, than they appear. You know, we talked about in this paper about this APC2A and 2B. One of the, one of the things we found is that there are some that externally rotate and there's no flexion and extension, but there are some that externally rotate, and there is flexion and extension instability. And I, and I think that those two are very different. They're very different animals. So the question is, well, do you have to treat those differently than the ones that do have flexion, extension, and stability? And I, and I think the other thing that, that was interesting that kind of came out of the EUAs was this whole concept of the occult LC3 that we're all um, you know, familiar with. You know, you start to examine some of these and you've got a lateral compression, but lo and behold, actually the contralateral SI joint is actually unstable a little bit. The EUA can help elucidate some of these occult LC3 fractures in addition, in addition to the, the, uh, just the plain lateral compression. And I, I left the lateral compression, which is where you 
it just came to with this the pictures here. I left that for last to discuss, I think, because you've got, I think, the greatest <laughs> gray zone and controversy associated with these ones. And I still have people, you know, complaining about this and criticizing it. Everything that we did, especially for this, was completely arbitrary. We had to define something. We had to have some sort, something to kind of move off of, you know. And, you know, the, the paper that Bruce, Sims, and Riley put out with regards to complete or incomplete, that really kind of opened up a whole new area, too, of thinking, you know. what? So we kind of took that concept and applied it to the LC ones and say, okay, here's a batch that now we're going to EUA because there are some that look exactly the same. They have minimal displacement. Maybe it's a complete sacral fracture, but there's really no displacement, and there's not a lot of residual deformity. And you can have two different clinical presentations. You can have a patient sitting on the end of the bed with this exact film here, eating breakfast, saying, Doc, when the hell can I go home? And you can have the same set of films in another patient where they're laying in bed and they're saying, don't touch me, I hurt too much, don't even roll me to clean me. These things can present clinically in different ways. And I think that's is where it helps us to say, okay, maybe this person is having more pain than we really think they should have. Maybe they benefit from something like an EUA or a variation on that theme. In terms of trying to decide a threshold for saying, yes, this is unstable or this is stable. How much rotation is too much rotation? How much overlap or displacement? How do you quantify it? And does that actually correlate with anything that we know functionally and clinically? No. The answer to that is no, obviously. This is just a starting point to try to really bring out the fact that, that okay, you have someone who has a pelvic fracture that looks fairly innocuous that the vast majority of the time will be able to be treated successfully in a non-operative fashion without displacing. But it's not binary. It's not zero and 100%. There are some that look innocuous that are going to move. And maybe it's those ones that are painful and can't mobilize. Maybe it's something different. The EUA helps to, I think, to treat those people to say, well, oh, we got hardly any deformity, but boy, they've got a lot of pain and they can't mobilize. Maybe they're more unstable than we think. And sure enough, some of them are. That's a completely arbitrary uh, distinction and, and even judgment call at the time, isn't it? Right? And I think that's why this one continues to be so controversial. That is an excellent summary. I think we're going to move on. If you were to design this today, would you have done anything differently? What would be really nice to know is that if you could take all of these same injuries, you give everybody an EUA, and then you treat some operatively and some non-operatively, and then you see where they heal, and then you figure out what their functional limitations, problems, what are complications, malunion, non-union rate is, and see if there's any correlation to that with the EUA. But, you know, the big criticisms that I've heard about this is, well, Saji can't take everybody to the OR. Well, what about you can't give everybody an anesthetic, you know. You don't have to give people an anesthetic for this. You can just sedate them while you do the EUA and wake them up from that if you decide not to operate and give them a full anesthetic if you decide to operate. But it's a real thing trying to find OR time and put this into an OR schedule. And you don't want to unnecessarily EUA and sedate and anesthetize people that don't need to, to do it. And so I, I think that to, to design a study now on this really would be nice to figure out who really needs the EUA. And the hardest thing in redesigning this study is going to be to define what is your threshold for too much movement, too much motion. If you could give a one-minute synopsis on the take-home points and how this affects your practice and how you use this in current times. A, things can be more unstable than they appear, and B, that there are, in fact, 
other planes of instability that we may not be recognizing, and that some of the poor results we see in pelvic fractures may in fact be due to unrecognized instability that's going undertreated. It's interesting how EUA have, has affected my practice because I got on the bandwagon, so I was doing a lot. And you know, now for me, I use EUA pretty specifically for in two scenarios now. One is when people have fairly innocuous looking static imaging, but are complaining of more pain and are having difficulty mobilizing. So I think it, maybe this is more unstable than it's letting on. But I really try to mobilize people more than I did even five or five years ago. I really kind of swung more back to just let them mobilize, just see how they do. The other for me is where, where I still I really haven't changed at all is this APC2A to APC2B. If they flex and extend, as well as externally rotate, those are the people that I will add supplemental fixation into because to, to protect the anterior fixation. And that's, that's where I am now. Ask me tomorrow, it'll be a different answer. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.